All right, so as, as this is warming up, name a phylum that we've talked about so far. Oh, no. Cnidaria is one, okay? Periphera is another, and the current one. Mollusks. Okay, so Cnidaria was said first. What are some classes of Cnidarians? Okay, Scyphozoa is one, and those are what type of animals? Jellyfish. Okay, what's another class of Cnidarians? Hydrozoa, and they change forms from uh, one appearance to another. What is that called? That is dimorphism, okay? And then the one that is permanently sessile is called the class what? The one that is permanently sessile. We're hearing all the answers come from over there. How about over here? That's, you're not going to find that on your current paper. What's that? No, we're, we're talking about cnidarians. The class that is permanently sessile starts the letter A. That's the actual animal, sea anemones, which are anthozoans. Okay, so why do those animals belong in that phylum? They've got radial symmetry, they have tentacles, and they produce venom. Okay? Sponges are sessile, they've got pores, they're filter feeders. And then they've got an opening structure, which is an osculum. Now, the current one, the mollusks. What's the characteristic of all mollusks? They've got a shell, and for feeding, they've all got what? It's on the bottom of this slide right here. They've all got a radula. Okay, so our first class of mollusks, okay, which are called gastropods, okay? Actually, I thought, I thought this is the slide that I had left off. I don't know if I hit yeah, something. Yeah. Okay, so we have this. Now we start talking about the gastropods. Okay. And this is certainly true. We know that they're sluggish. Obviously, they're very slow. That's why you say, gosh, you're slow as a snail. Do you not have a handout or... Uh. Yep. And my binder, it, I had to use it on Saturday, so it's currently at home. Oh, I thought maybe there's pancake batter all over it. That's no. what you're going to say. That's where I thought that story was um, going. Or syrup, or... Because no, you don't want to spill syrup. That would be a sticky situation. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah, I know. See, that's what... I wish my boss would say that more. Maybe I'm just not right. Yeah, you said you are correct. <laughs> See, we, we develop life skills in these classes, too. Yep. Just on account of, and you know the answer to this, women's two favorite words that their guy will tell them. That's three words. You are right. Yeah, but isn't your... Uh, Possessive pronoun? Yeah, trust me. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't, when you say Y-O-U-R, I think the connotation for that is different when saying U-A-R-E, right. At least that's my understanding. That's how I like to explain it. But that's still two words, though. But I go by the connotation as two words, that's all. Okay, well, it's not arguing. That's just my point, and I'm explaining that's how I look at it. So if you say that, that you're right, well then, okay, two words. It's just a matter of interpretation. Just like your matter of interpretation, say, yeah, they're your two favorite words. Right, ladies? Sure. Right. Very good. Okay, one of the aspects that we see a process of torsion, okay, 
if you were to, I think you have to be very specific when it comes to uh, putting lug nuts on racing cars or adjusting the valve covers on your vehicle. You want that hex nut or that bolt to be tightened very precisely. What tool does that? You know, as you're tightening it, it's got a little dial on there that tells you how much torque you're putting on that. Yeah, it's a torque. Okay. The idea behind that, a torque is a type of twist or pull. Okay. Mainly a type of twist. So sometimes if you want to work out your, your abdomen, okay, um, you can do uh, what you call torsion uh, type of uh, workout. Uh, this bar isn't long enough, but you get the idea. You do this, and then you can exercise your abdomen like that, called torsion, torsion bars or torsion workout. Well, for some reason, just the way the man designed these animals, their mantle cavity goes through this process of torsion. Okay. Now, I think it does that because it lengthens their digestive tract, mainly their small intestine. So if it makes that longer, why might that be an advantage to have your small intestine actually much longer than what it normally would be? What's the function that you believe is any small intestine? Because remember, this is not intracellular digestion anymore, it's extracellular, so it's taking place outside the cells, which means inside the intestines, that's where it takes place. Why is having it longer going to be an advantage then? You can get more nutrients out of there. I just keep glancing down at here to make sure my battery pack is still working. So um, we can look at this at a later time. Okay. So yes, you get more of a length of the small intestine you can absorb more nutrients. It's more efficient then. So what happens is when we say 180 degrees, it's actually going to lengthen its small intestine then. So what was once in the back has now become anterior. And for no rhyme or reason, that's actually what happens inside these animals. Oh, do you need to back up? Okay. Well, so you can just get this later because it's being recorded. You do whatever is most beneficial for you. Okay. And you can recall all this information just, just like that. Just like that. Awesome. See, trust me. See, we learn everything all the time. Okay. So... If I'm not mistaken, that should be shown in actually in your books. And I think it actually shows that process. Yep. So for some odd reason, and it's illustrating that on page 187. That's what this diagram oops, is trying to illustrate over here. To where what was once in the back has now become towards the front side for some reason just the way the man upstairs designed these animals to lengthen that intestine so as you can see their type of food gathering is actually quite diverse because otherwise, we've only looked at plant eaters, in other words, the sponges, because they were filter feeders, feeding on algae. Then you could say the others that we moved on to with that of the cnidarians are actually carnivorous. And here we see quite a variety of, uh, again, food gathering habits, uh, herbivores, plankton, uh, scavengers. What does a scavenger feed upon dead animals okay 
and carnivorous we certainly know are feeding upon other animals. So why are these so important as far as this type of diet? Why is scavenging going to be important for any type of ecological relationship? If they're feeding upon dead animals, what happens to animals on the side of the road if they've been laying there for a while? They get rotten because you can look in, not, you don't want to look inside, but you can see their belly starts to get inflated like this. Right, because in that gas is coming from the bacteria consuming that. It gives off that gas on the inside. And if you wanted to, you could take a knife and stab that. And then there's going to be liquids, there's going to be gas all released at the same time. But the main idea is that's coming from bacteria. If you have scavengers feeding upon that, then these harmful bacteria cannot get a foothold in any ecological relationship. That's why scavenging is so important. Plus, do scavengers have to work hard for their meals? No. That maybe trying to find something dead, you could say maybe uh, working hard for that, but you don't have to put much effort into going after the animal. Okay. Let's see here. What do we got on the gastropods? And we should be getting close to the bivalves, okay? Yep, we are, okay. I don't have it up on the schedule yet. It probably will be next Tuesday, I'm guessing. So a week from today, which puts us at what? November 2nd, I think is a week from tomorrow. A week from today is November 1st. A week from tomorrow will be November 2nd. It'll be our goal to look at your second type of mollusk which we've said before, for dissecting purposes, would be what animal would you guess? Mm -hmm. It's the squids, because those are cephalopods, okay? The most advanced animals within this phylum. So that's going to be on our schedule a week from uh, today, or tomorrow, excuse me. And then the idea of possibly, we've done this in the past, is you get to take them down to the elementary classroom and you get to explain everything that you know about cephalopods. How do you pronounce that? Cephalopods. Cephalopods. Yeah. Yep. Probably, oh, someone's talking about me. My nose is itching. Oh. Anyway. But you've heard that before, right? Your nose is itching. Someone's talking about you. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So typically it's probably the fourth grade. That is Mrs. Lee's class, right? Miss, Mrs. Mann. Okay. Um, possibly we'll be looking at that then. And then also next week, you two get to explain hand cream. To Mrs. Lee's class. Have them come down. You'll get to do that activity with them. Now typically we've had some people make some pretty good lotion. It's really really good but the downside of that it's really greasy too. I mean when you put lotion on your hands you don't like to have that greasy feeling. Have you ever bought a canister of lotion by mistake? You, you, you're just trying it out and you say god I don't like how my hands feel after this. I don't know if that there's any act. Uh, yeah, I don't use lotion because I feel greasy. Okay. Oh. 
but how do we do that keep your fingers from cracking then? Vaseline? That's what I might do. Put it on there, and that does a pretty good job too. Okay. Okay. Now, these mucus balls, if you want to call it that, okay? Why would that be an advantage for these snails? Not only for food gathering purposes, but why locomotion, movement? Why would that be important for them? Yeah, it makes it smooth. It makes it easier for them to move along because they're not very fast to begin with. Okay, so this just helps them move along. These mucus balls, if you want to call that, okay, it mainly gets trapped inside of there. It just makes it easier for them to consume because, again, the speed of these animals is not very fast. So that's going to be an advantage for them. And then the last slide for the gastropods, okay, will be talking about their internal form and function, okay. Circulation. Last week, what was significant about the circulatory system of these animals, if we remember? The correlation we made was headaches in the front of your skull. Sinuses. So, when we talk about sinuses, that must mean this blood pools in open sinuses, which it does. That's what we mean by an open circulatory system. So... Once the animal contracts its muscles then, it pushes that blood back into circulation then. Now, what's the meta metabolism of these animals? Is it quite fast or is it quite slow? Yeah, it's quite slow because we're not going to be talking about any type of animals with a quick metabolism until you talk about those that are endothermic. And that won't be until the vertebrates, but not all vertebrates are endothermic. There's only two types of, well, you could say three if you want to include humans. Then the other two are the avian class, birds, and of course the mammals, which are also endothermic. Tactile organs, those are just used if you're Making tactical decisions just means you're making those off of the best opportunities of information that you have. Tactile organs are best suited for them to be successful in their food gathering process. That's what we mean by tactile organs. All right, so that's all I've got for today. Tomorrow we'll start talking about the clams or the bivalves. And then probably on... Thursday and Friday, we'll look at the, uh, a video of the cuttlefish, which is actually quite neat because they can change the color of their skin upon just thinking about it, which is actually quite unique in the animal kingdom. All right, that's all I have. We'll catch up to you next time.